In Kentucky, over 50,000 small businesses received approximately $5.3 billion in loans. Uh, the last uh, loans were originated in August, and uh, that the authorization for the PPP program expired um, on uh, August the uh, 8th, I believe. And so uh, uh, the, uh, that first round was effective in terms of providing emergency liquidity. Some of some businesses um, in, in the six district central Kentucky, I know have uh, proceeded through the forgiveness process, um, but some, uh, some have not. And there's been some uncertainty around that. And there certainly needs to be some streamlining of the forgiveness process, which I will address. Um, um, but the bottom line is that um, uh, we need another round because the pandemic has continued to uh, be with us. And uh, we've seen uh, obviously a spike in infections and which have led to some of the additional lockdowns uh, that have been uh, devastating uh, for the economy. And so particularly in certain uh, sectors of our economy, certain industries, travel, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, um, retail, we continue to see protracted periods of distress, which necessitate another round of the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, the framework that you're hearing about or reading about in Washington for an additional $908 billion in, in, in economic relief would include a second round of Paycheck Protection Program. The good news is that uh, there's uh, nearly $140 billion of funding for the Paycheck Protection Program that's still uh, authorized. Um, it's been appropriated. It just not. It just needs to be reauthorized, reloaded, if you will. So there's significant amount of money that's already there for a second round. I think there's general consensus that it needs to be a little bit more targeted in some ways, so that it only goes to those businesses that are truly in distress. Some businesses have done quite well in logistics and uh, in uh, maybe uh, the drive-through type businesses, um, and others um, such as. Uh, dine-in uh, restaurants have really faced significant distress. Some of our own, we've lost many of our own uh, businesses in, in Lexington uh, that you may know about. Um, and so in some respects, uh, you could see a PPP program that's more narrowly tailored just to those businesses that are um, in significant distress. On the other hand, we know we need to expand eligibility for 501c6s, the destination marketing organizations like Visit Lex, like Commerce Lexington itself, chambers of commerce that have continued to operate to provide services to their members, even while not being eligible for the first round of PPP. Uh, we're not, not only am I a co-sponsor of a bill that would expand PPP to those types of organizations and um, some not-for-profit organizations, um, but also, um, um, you know, actively supporting uh, through letters and communications with leadership and the negotiators that, 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 that those changes be made to PPP. A final change that needs to happen uh, is the feedback that we're getting from the, the borrowing businesses themselves and certainly from the lenders, um, both banks and credit unions in the 6th District and around the country who are telling us that in order to encourage additional um, and continued lender participation in the second round of PPP, we need to have a streamlined forgiveness process. It's too bureaucratic. It's very difficult right now to deal with the Small Business Administration on the forgiveness side. Those of you businesses that have not received your forgiveness yet, I know you can sympathize with that. Certainly our lenders are frustrated with the difficulties with forgiveness. Uh, we were able to be somewhat successful in June in getting the Treasury Department to, um, to give us a three-page easy uh, forgiveness form and then in um, earlier this fall, we were successful in uh, obtaining a ruling from Treasury that there would be a, a very streamlined forgiveness for small loans, loans under $50,000. And that helped, I think, prompt some of the beginning of the forgiveness uh, process for many businesses that have loans less than $50,000. But what we're advocating for in this new bill uh, would be um, not only that we'd have an, an, another uh, 135 plus billion dollars reprogrammed uh, for a second uh, PPP round. Uh, but also we would see that 501c6 organizations um, become eligible, uh, those 501c6s with 300 or fewer employees. Uh, the 60-40 requirement would remain 
um, but eligible expenses would also now include um, uh, covered operation expenditures, payments for software, cloud computing, other human resources and accounting needs, also property damage costs, costs related to property damage due to public disturbances um, that occurred during 2020 that are not covered by insurance. Uh, also covered supplier costs, expenditures to a supplier pursuant to a contract for goods in effect prior to February 15, 2020. Also personal protective equipment. Um, Okay, just so everybody knows, we are having a little bit of a technical difficulty and uh, we're gonna be reconnecting back with the Congressman here. So hang tight with us. So um, just so you know, when uh, we get back live with the Congressman, uh, some of the things that we've been hearing from you all, uh, he's hit on a couple, the PPP program, uh, kind of that renewal um, and bringing that back. A lot of people have run out of those funds, but also there were groups that were left out, so we're all very active trying to get 501c6s um, as well as the um, di uh, direct management organizations like Visit Lex to have that opportunity for coverage. Uh, but also, we're hearing a lot, uh, you know, from the hospitality, travel-related uh, industry. So we'll be talking with him uh, about that as well. Uh, we're starting to hear a lot from small business. Uh, regarding um, another concern for small business, that's the tax implications of PPP loans and other government aid provided uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And so hopefully there'll be some adjustments made to the tax code. Uh, I think most people were under the belief or uh, anticipation that those funds would um, avoid uh, you know, tax. So anyway, that issue is, is uh, an issue we're trying to work through. Uh, we continue to hear it, uh, liability reform. Um, we know uh, back a month or so ago, that was a very lively piece of conversation. And so we're trying to um, make sure that that has not taken a second seat. You know, for those entities that have been very forthcoming and doing everything possible um, uh, to, to uh, have some type of uh, relief uh, from that would be important. And I think now we have uh, the Congressman back so modern day, this is what we get to deal with, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. Let me just uh, sum up real quick. Um, Bob, sorry about that. That's okay. So we, we um, uh, on, the, on the streamlined forgiveness for the PPP loans um, uh, and, and the, the reauthorization, so we're looking at, you know, um, a maximum loan in the second round would be reduced to $2 million. Uh, that covers most uh, businesses and a business would not be able to exceed 10 million on both the first and the second round of the PPP loan. Uh, that's what we're looking at. And then last week, um, when Secretary Mnuchin and Chairman Powell were in front of the Financial Services Committee, I asked the Secretary Mnuchin about the need for streamlined PPP forgiveness. Again, this is coming from both the small business community, your members, and also lenders who recognize the need for streamlined forgiveness in order to incentivize lenders to participate in a second round. And I, I cited to Secretary Mnuchin a survey from the Kentucky Bankers Association that indicated that 27% that of Kentucky community banks would not participate in another round of PPP without streamlined forgiveness and clear rules of the road. So ensuring lender participation is a priority and I think um, we, we, uh, uh, we are working on that in the second relief bill. Let me also point out that many um, of your members and small businesses have asked about the uh, deductibility uh, uh, of expenses uh, of using the proceeds of the PPP loans uh, to hire workers and then having the IRS not allow that to be um, deducted as a business expense. I have signed a letter, I have co-sponsored a bill, and I've um, raised on multiple occasions with leadership the need for us to uh, change the law in this relief package to allow businesses who receive PPP loans and then spend that to keep workers on the payroll as the program was intended to also then deduct that as a business expense. Many uh, of my constituent businesses have told me that they would not have taken the PPP loan uh, had they known that they would not be able to uh, deduct uh, the, the proceeds that they're using to, to keep workers on the payroll. 
The, the program was intended by Congress to help businesses retain employees, and I think uh, that change would be in keeping with the original intent. We're working on that. We don't have that uh, finalized, but I know that's important to many businesses, and we're working to have that included. Um, uh, uh, Whip Steve Scalise is sympathetic to that, and he's he and I are working together to try to get that into the final final package. What's holding us up? Why do we have a, a weak delay in this? It's mainly a debate between um, how much uh, relief is going to uh, be included in the package for state and local governments and the contours of a liability protection feature. Uh, Leader McConnell is working very, very diligently to advocate for, for liability protection uh, as part of the, the top level negotiations. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of two, two bills that would deliver a liability shield for colleges, universities, and schools, and also one that would help reopen our businesses and provide a liability protection for businesses. I'm hopeful that that will be included. Um, and one final point, we have spent now uh, multiple trillions of dollars on COVID relief. We've needed to do that because of the uh, economic distress. Uh, but um, we also need to be cognizant that our national debt is now soaring to uh, $27 uh, trillion. How can we make this uh, uh, f uh, fourth phase uh, fiscally responsible? Uh, the answer is that we, we can repurpose not only the $140 billion uh, that was unused from PPP as part of this $908 billion package, but also uh, I'm encouraging uh, that uh, I, I'm encouraging leadership to use the unused $425 billion that was put into the Exchange Stabilization Fund at Treasury to backstop some of these emergency lending programs that frankly have been very underutilized, repurpose those funds to recapitalize PPP and some of the additional funding that we're going to need for state and local governments and additional funding that we're going to need for hospitals, for vaccine distribution, uh, and for uh, and for additional testing capabilities, uh, I think that is the fiscally responsible way to get to that 908 billion dollars to help our state local governments and to deliver a second round of PPP. If there are questions, I'm happy to uh, to take them. So there, we do have uh, some questions. Yeah, and Zoom's been dropping, I guess here. So anyway, that's the new world we get to live in, Congressman. So uh, one of the questions is, if not this week. Yeah, will will the, uh, the the likelihood of a package, uh, a phase four, not occur until after inauguration day? If then, um, what's the what's the thinking? No, I'm I'm actually optimistic that we're going to get this done next week. We're going to pass the uh, defense authorization bill this week, and then next week I anticipate uh, the final details coming together on a COVID relief package that will be part of the year-end spending bill. So it's going to be a big spending bill. But again, uh, uh, I am encouraging, and I, I, th I think um, what a lot of uh, my colleagues are agreeing to at this point is in order to make this uh, cost effective is to repurpose some of the, the CARES Act money that has not yet been deployed. So the $140 billion that has not been used for PPP plus the $429 billion that has been that's uh, unused funds from, from the Treasury Department, what's called the Exchange Stabilization Fund, that could be repurposed as part of the pay for for this $908 billion package. That's a powerful phase for, um, I wouldn't call it stimulus, but a relief package that will get many businesses through uh, to, the, to the vaccine. Very good. And, yep. No, go ahead. And it, it'll also provide additional support for our healthcare, uh, our healthcare infrastructure for our hospitals. Uh, it'll help with uh, vaccine distribution. It will continue to help with testing um, and PPE, uh, uh, personal protective equipment, to make sure our hospitals, as we see this surge, continue to get what they need. I also continue to strongly support inclusion of liability protection in here so that uh, businesses are not faced or schools and universities do not face frivolous lawsuits. That's really important to uh, reopening. Very good. And Congressman, just so you know, and to all of our participants, uh, since we've been kind of up and down uh, with Zoom checking out on us a couple of times, I'm going to probably ask some questions that the Congressman did cover, but I just want to make sure that some of these items do get um, 
uh, uh, touched on again. Uh, in the hospitality and travel uh, related businesses, do you, I know you commented on uh, PPP, but do you anticipate any other federal relief programs specifically targeted to those uh, businesses in this industry? Yes, we're, we're actively advocating for uh, a, a segment of the, the new uh, repurposed PPP program to be targeted towards um, commercial real estate, um, basically rental assistance that can flow through to creditors. Um, so in other words, we would change the ratio. What we're advocating for is, is, is changing the ratio of from 60, 40, where, the, where you have businesses that don't have a large payroll, but they do have debt service obligations, but no customers, no patrons, uh, hotels and the like. Um, so we, we want to see this uh, uh, repurposed PPP program, um, at least part of it, um, tailored for that uh, commercial real estate segment and especially hotels, hospitality uh, that, that need uh, assistance um, on their debt service. So that, that is, uh, I think, in play. There, there's a bill that I co-sponsored called the HOPE Act. I don't, uh, that would allow for, um, it, it would allow for um, a specific program of, um, uh, that, that, would, that would basically allow the government to take an equity position um, in some of these businesses uh, so that um, they, do, they do not default on their uh, special servicing agreements with um, especially CMBS, the commercial mortgage-backed securities, the, the, the investors in these properties, uh, which typically have very inflexible uh, 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 agreements. But um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not anticipating that bill getting in the final package, but it could be that a segment of the PPP program could be used for, uh, for debt service for these particular types of distressed businesses. And, uh, okay, so we're back here. Um, I was just commenting on why it's important for us to have that relationship with you all. So let me go back to the, I know you touched on the, the forgiveness loan aspect, uh, but you know, small business has really been hitting us pretty hard on the tax implications of the PPP loans and other government aid they received. So you really hit pretty hard on that. Is that adjusting the tax code? Is that what's going to be required there? Yes, it's, okay. it's, the Treasury Department has resisted our calls for an administrative change. Their, their position is that businesses can't double dip with assistance funding and deductibility. So when you retain workers at, at your business as a result of a PPP loan, uh, many, of, many business owners were expecting to then continue to be able to deduct the wages or salaries of their workers as a, uh, as a, as a business expense. Uh, Treasury has ruled that that is ineligible, that, that businesses cannot uh, use the assistance funding uh, as a, an eligible expense for, de for purposes of deductibility. Um, maybe in normal circumstances that requirement would make sense, but um, I believe that we do need to make accommodations for PPP given the fact that many businesses had the expectation that when they brought back their workers they would continue to be able to deduct those expenses. Um, you, you know, constituents have told us that, look, uh, PPP allowed them to keep their workers on the payroll, um, and it was only because of PPP that it made economic sense to retain them. We wanted businesses, that was con Congress's intent, wanted businesses to keep workers on the payroll, um, but they wouldn't have kept them on the payroll had they known right. that there would be a big tax bill at the end. So. We need to include this fix in the in the relief package, and Treasury is telling us they can't do it administratively. They need us to change the tax code for the PPP program. Well, that's important for people to hear, and I got to tell you, we're getting inundated with those kind of calls now. I know you touched on the liability reform, but let me jump ahead uh, here to broadband deployment and the efforts to close the digital divide in underserved uh, areas. Do you see more funding? Uh, coming um, because we've learned, if nothing, we've learned a lot of things in COVID-19. Uh, but one thing is connectivity from young kids and education all the way up to seniors and business in between. So, do you see uh, more funds, more support uh, federally for for local efforts and regional efforts? Yeah, you know, taxpayers have been incredibly generous to state and local governments uh, in the CARES Act, and I, it looks like there'll be an additional tranche of. Uh, taxpayer relief for state and local governments. What I want to see is more flexibility given to local governments to use 
these coronavirus relief funds, the funds that go to state and local governments and ultimately to school districts uh, to allow them uh, flexibility for using those funds for broadband deployment. We know how vitally important distance learning has become and also distance working. Um, for our economy to continue to operate during a pandemic, we need better broadband connectivity. I'm a co-sponsor of a bill, or I've introduced a bill that would give uh, fiscal courts, local governments, municipalities flexibility to use these funds uh, to, to, for enhanced broadband um, deployment and uh, uh, connectivity. Um, um, also, there's another bill that uh, Congressman Adderholt from Alabama have introduced called the EXTEND Act uh, that would build off of my Rural Broadband Expansion Act and add additional safeguards such as ensuring that underserved areas receive priority, municipal broadband and overbuilding limitations, and requiring that dispersed funds are only used for broadband projects. Um, so my hope is that if there's additional money included in this next relief package for state and local governments that we allow state and local governments to use that for broadband. One final point about school closures. Um, we need to follow the science on school closures. It's not only hurting our kids, but it's hurting, uh, I know businesses, your members, in terms of being able to retain workers and keep them coming to work because uh, of the, the lockdowns of schools. We're really not following the science here on, on school lockdowns. Um, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has reported that Kentucky children ages 0 to 19, we've only had one reported death, and that death was a, a, a child with a major pre-existing condition issue. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences say children have a 66% lower odds of being diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, if you're concerned about teachers, and we all are, uh, especially older teachers, studies are still showing that children play a very small role in population transmission infection. Um, we know the negative repercussions of keeping kids out of school are, are, are disastrous in terms of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the gap in terms of learning. All right. Well, unfortunately, um, it looks like the connection is going to be a continuing challenge and the congressman and um, so um, we're going to have to end the part with the congressman. But we want to bring Tyler White back, president of the Kentucky Coal Association. So we're uh, pulling him in. I know we had some difficulties on the front end, and um, not everybody got to hear uh, his message. So we're going to bring Tyler back on to, uh, to comment. There he is. Awesome. Hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm not sure if you can or not. No, we can. Go ahead. Bob? Yep, go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah. Hey, just, uh, just to reiterate, thanks to Congressman Barr. Um, I said it earlier in my remarks, but not, not all uh, representatives are created equal. We really do have, a, uh, have, have one of the best representatives in Congress in, in Andy, um, and it's, uh, it's refreshing to hear his take and, and hear him advocate for the businesses here in, in central Kentucky and for the nation as a whole. Just a reminder to everyone, um, coal, coal is a, uh, a major economic driver uh, for a lot of different reasons here in the state of Kentucky. 71% um, of the power produced in Kentucky is produced by coal, keeping us uh, one of the, the lowest electricity costs in the nation. Um, and that makes us competitive. It makes us competitive, comparatively speaking, to other states when attracting businesses. And that's important for uh, not just Lexington, but for Central Kentucky and Kentucky as a whole, and we see that power. Uh, we see that power sustaining around that level. So we need to protect the resource that we have here. And uh, with that being said, I also want to encourage all of you all to go to Southern Lights, enjoy Southern Lights, powered by Friends of Coal. Um, it's a good COVID-friendly uh, environment. Um, and with that being said, I'll I'll stop talking so you all can listen to the the rest of Andy and and thank you Bob again and Commerce Lexington for hosting this meeting. Well, just tell you the power of Tyler. You got the congressman back on for us. So we, we're trying a different means now. Uh, we've got the congressman on his cell phone. So uh, thank you, um, Kentucky, Kentucky Coal Association and uh, Andy. Thank you for hanging in here with us. I know your schedule is really crazy right now. So. Um, 
we were just talking about hopefully any additional funding for broadband deployment and the digital divide issues and uh, and you were you're hitting it out of the park there and so go right ahead well yeah I'll just I'll just conclude by saying you know it, we need to open up the schools uh, we, we this uh, the the CDC and Dr. Fauci are all telling us this, the, the they're all telling us that we need to, to uh, go back the kids need to go back to school the, there's low transmission rates there's low hospitalization rates for kids um, and so I think it's I think it's really important to, to recognize that the science is telling us uh, that that the children need to go back to school um, in fact um, uh, the CDC director is telling us that one of the safest places for kids to be is actually in school. So that's my position. Um, uh, obviously, state and local officials have to make those decisions on their own, but I think it's a real impediment, not just to our economy and letting parents go back to work, uh, but it's not good for the kids. It's, it's not healthy for the children to be out of school. So I just did want to weigh in on that, but we know we have a job to do here in Washington over the next week to, to finalize uh, this uh, final relief package. I'm optimistic that we're going to get it done, streamline the forgiveness program, do another round of PPP, include some liability uh, protection in there. There will be uh, probably a compromise on state and local funding, and hopefully it will come with some uh, flexibility so that state and local governments can use that for a broadband uh, broadband build out and th and that's and that's really important so um, uh, please feel free to continue to weigh in with our office on the details uh, we want to be there for you and, and uh, advocate uh, uh, for you and I think we are we do see the light at the end of the tunnel I am uh, relatively optimistic about uh, about the future with this additional relief package um, a vac not only vaccine, but also uh, better testing is uh, is continuing to be on the on the way. And if we get uh, another round of PPP and liability protection, I really think the economy can come out of the on the back end of this uh, very very strong. So, um, uh, best wishes for a, a wonderful holiday season for all of you and my constituents um, in the business community, to your employees, your customers, your families. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Hope you all have. Uh, a, a good uh, a good holiday season and and uh, hopefully we can give you uh, another COVID relief package uh, as a Christmas gift. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Congressman. And I, I said it uh, a little bit earlier, and that is you really find out a lot about individuals, um, not during normal times, but when there's a threat. And in the case of COVID-19 and all the challenges that this community, this region has faced, uh, you were every place you needed to be. Every time we reached out, you were so accessible. But a great compliment has to be paid to your staff. They are tremendous. They got us answers quickly. One of the things that we felt good about is we could get results, answers back to people, and we knew they were right on 100%. And so we cut through a lot of uh, the, the chatter at the time. So anyway, uh, you played that essential role. We appreciate you. We admire the job you're doing, and thank you very much for sticking with us, especially today here. Yeah, sorry for the technology problems, but yes, thank you for thanking my staff. Uh, they do a great job, and Anthony Allen uh, in the district office leading our small business response team, and in Washington, Dan Taylor, who is a great liaison to us at the Financial Services Committee uh, to Treasury and the Fed. Uh, and the Small Business Administration. So hang in there, everyone. It's a tough time. We continue to plow through, uh, but I do see the light at the end of the tunnel, and we're all in it together. Thanks so much. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you soon, and happy holidays to you as well. Thank you, Congressman. Hey, thank you. And I want to thank all the attendees hanging in there with us. Um, uh, we appreciate that, and um, uh, we'll get that kind of shored up before our next session. But our next session begins at 2.30, and this is one you're not going to want to miss. This is uh, an incredible company, App Harvest, Matt Gosnell, who's going to be with us to talk about what they're doing. And, uh, you know, you, you hear our leaders talking about uh, ag tech. Well, here's a great example of what ag tech, what ag tech can mean for Central Kentucky. So we look forward to uh, uh, connecting back with you at 2.30. Thank you, everyone.